Good morning. Happy Easter. It is tradition that at times like this, we would say, he is risen, and you would respond with, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. One announcement today I just want to mention. On Monday, April 17th, we'll have our next primetime lunch. Tomorrow is the deadline to sign up, so please go to our website and sign up. And if you can't get that done, you want to call the office, you can do that as well. Great time to be together and enjoy one another. Let's celebrate Easter today. Father, thank you that Christ has, in fact, risen from the dead. Thank you that he has gotten victory over death and sin and provided for us a way of new life new life on this earth and new life for eternity with you. Help us today to celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen. The king has returned. The prophecies fulfilled. Years of longing are over. The king has returned. And now all will be made right. Amidst shouts of praise and tears of joy, the pleading for justice, the cries for our enemies' defeat. The king has returned. The king who was driven from his land as an infant, who spent his first years as a refugee, who understands suffering. But this king is not who we were looking for. This king brings justice, not over our enemies, but in the midst of our enemies. He brings peace, not in our land, but in our souls. He is the answer to the prayer we did not know we were praying. The king has returned. held a branch, now gripped a hammer. The king is dead. This king of kings who embraced the very nature of a servant. This prince of peace, broken for us. This commander of angels, surrendered to a cross. This king joins us in our suffering, empathizes in our weakness, and he calls us to die with him, to lay down our lives, to live in surrender, that we may be fully alive. The king is dead.
story is told that years ago, in communist Russia, one of the party leaders showed up to one of the factories. All of the men of the factory were brought into a room. They were sat down on chairs, and for the next hour, the Communist Party official stood at a podium, regaled each and every one of the men with stories of how communism was going to be victorious, how God was dead, and how the people were now in charge. Finishing his one-hour speech, he went back, sat down at his chair, and for a moment, nobody moved, nobody said a word, and there was silence. Finally, one of the men slowly rose to his feet and shouted out, He is risen! And every one of the men in the room stood to their feet and shouted back, he is risen indeed. No matter what you read in the news, no matter what our world is facing, remember, he is risen, he is risen indeed. It is God's answer. Is he going to be victorious? If death cannot defeat him, there is not one ism, not one issue, not one problem that will defeat God. So in the same spirit, I invite you, stand together as one person, as we again remember, Jesus is risen. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. The Lord has risen. Take your hymn books, turn to number 367, and with that kind of energy, let us sing together to the Lord. as you do so. 
would invite you to take your copy of God's Word, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 in a pew Bible, it's page 1,545. We want to take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 through 68. This is Jesus before the Sanhedrin. You may, may remember a group of 70 individuals charged essentially as the high court of Israel at this time. Jesus is there to be tried by the leaders of his, um, of his people, of his nation. Beginning in verse 57, this is what Matthew records for us. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? If you would join me for prayer. Father, as we read through these scriptures, we are reminded that earthly courts often get things wrong. Here in the text, we read where the Sanhedrin spit on Jesus, they physically assaulted him, something they were not even permitted to do. It reminds us justice is not found in human courts. It can only be found through Jesus. Father, our prayer is that we would be about justice, that we would speak on behalf of Jesus, that we would be after truth. Father, allow us to be peacemakers in the midst of a world that increasingly seems to want to be at odds. We want to pray, Father, that we would respond with patience and grace and kindness as Jesus did, not lashing out, not speaking ill. Father, he is our example for how to live in a world where there is injustice. We want to pray, Father, that we would take Jesus' confession to the world. For it is only when we see Jesus for who he really is that we can be about his business. Let us see Jesus again this morning. There is so much brokenness. Father, there is still death in the world for those who are struggling as they face uh, those that they love. Perhaps at the very end of their lives, we ask, Father, that you would pour out grace and support for them. We still live in a world where there is suffering. Father, allow us to be your hands and feet to, bro to bind up the broken uh, parts of people 
to comfort them in the midst of their suffering. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, for his resurrection, for it shows us we have that same resurrection power living in us. No matter what we're facing, we have the strength to honor and please you in all of it, even when it's tough. Help us to live in that way, Father. Use us as Jesus' incarnate hands and feet this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
that you've warmed up, I invite you to take your hymn books. Turn to number 357. We're going to stand together and sing Christ Arose. Let's stand. We see the character of people coming out in the difficult circumstances of their lives, in the, in the furnace of the experiences they have, the troubles, the triumphs, but more the difficulties. We see folks' character shine. I've been reading a book about, uh, it's the memoirs of Sojourna Truth. She was an 1800 slave woman in the United States. And it's interesting, the writer included a little detail that stuck out to me. It was a practice that she had around the virtue of honesty. She was so concerned with being honest with her, uh, the family that she was uh, owned by that she, even when her child would be expressing hunger, she would never steal bread from the family, even though she could get away with it, even though no one would have probably seen her. She never did that because she believed that even though she was living in slavery, she was accountable to God and wanted to live for him. Jesus lived with a great, immense amount of humility in his life on earth. He was in deep difficulties and troubles as he entered the city of Jerusalem. Now I know it's Easter. We've already sung that Christ arose. We've already said he is risen and you have said in return he is risen indeed. And so we want to get to Easter The problem I find is each time around this time of year, I think, but what about all the other? We talked together on Thursday night about the night before Jesus was arrested, and then we gather for the next time on Easter Sunday morning. But in that last week of Jesus' life, so much happens, and there's so much concentration on it when we read the Gospels, we don't want to overlook. And in the midst of giving Uh, sort of a survey of that last week, I want us to think about it in terms of what Jesus did not do. The first is this. 
Jesus did not respond to the insults. Jesus demonstrated humility in not responding to the insults and some of the accusations of the people around him. In Matthew 26, 59, it's recorded the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. People came forward and falsely accused him. But the gospel writer tells us he remained silent. Jesus was steadfast in order to accomplish his mission. He was concerned first and foremost with doing the will of God, not protecting his reputation. God the Father was going to use sinful, jealous people, people blinded by pride, to bring Jesus to his death. It takes humility to let people say what they want to say about you and not to defend yourself. With the explosion of social media, we don't see that kind of humility often displayed. People, in fact, on social media say all manner of things about people, some of which is true, some of which is not, but often it goes back and forth with one person saying one and another saying another, And in contrast to that, we see Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, remaining silent. Later on in the time he was asked if he was the Messiah, and his response was, you have said so. But I tell you, from from now on, you will not see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. He answers the question. Jesus declares himself as the Messiah. He doesn't deny it. When he went before Pilate, the Roman official, he was not willing to respond to the accusations. Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, and he said of that, you have said so. The soldiers have charge over him. They mock him. They mock him with their words. They insult him, but he does not respond. In chapter 27, three groups hurl insults at Jesus, and he does not respond to them. People passing by, various Jewish religious leaders and the other rebels who are crucified with him all hurl insults at him and Jesus stays steadfast and does not respond. Jesus also did not fight back. Last week in the call to worship we read about Jesus and he is the creator of everything. Could not the creator of everything manage to save himself from brutal treatment. In chapter 27, Jesus is turned over to be executed, and the guards who mock him are also the guards who beat him, place a crown of thorn on his heads, and multiple times people spit upon Jesus in that last week of his life. Could Jesus have defended himself? Of course he could have. And if this were a Hollywood movie, he would have. I think of how many stories we hear, how many books are written, how many movie themes or television shows are about the one who is mistreated at the beginning finally gets revenge in the end, and the revenge is in violence. Jesus created everything. Jesus was not lacking power or ability but he was exhibiting humility. He did not respond. Jesus spoke one time and a storm was calmed by his words. Jesus made the lame walk, the blind to see. Instead of retaliating, fighting back, he continued to accept the humble mission that God had sent him to accomplish. He did not fight back. Jesus also did not turn away from his mission. Jesus was sent by the Father to die as an atonement for our sins. That was the mission. Along the way, he gathered disciples and began the church and taught, but he was the humble servant who followed through with the mission. 
As I've said before, he could have retaliated against the cruel insults and the physical treatment, but he did not. He could have stopped the people who were mistreating him, but he did not. Matthew records Jesus in his agony over what was going to happen in Matthew 26. In this passage, he's gone to Gethsemane to pray with his disciples. He separates from the group. He takes a few with him and asks them to keep watch and to pray. And he goes off a little further and prays. And when he returns, they're asleep. And he goes back and he prays. But what is highlighted in this passage is that Jesus decides that his will needs to be subservient to the Father's will. It's not that he doesn't know what's coming. It's not that he can't anticipate because he knows in full knowledge what he's about to experience. He's going to experience physical agony. He's going to uh, experience the abandonment of his friends all so that he will accomplish the mission. Jesus never turned away from doing just what God wanted him to do. It was not beneath Jesus' status to serve humanity. It was his mission. Jesus did not turn away. Jesus did not run away. We read stories, maybe you even see vo- uh, video footage of people trying to escape arrest. Uh, I recently read about a scandal involving eBay where employees were sent to silence a couple who published an online newspaper kind of uh, blog that included stories about eBay. When the police tracked a person to a hotel room who worked for eBay, who had been following this couple on orders from high up in the company, they were told by the person who answered the phone that they would be right down to talk to them. Instead, they gathered their belongings and fled. Jesus did not run away. He went to the garden and went to the Father. And he went to a time of prayer and then he went out and met the people who would arrest him. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He didn't run away from the mission. He ran to it. There's one other thing that Jesus didn't do, and that is that Jesus in this section, in this last week of his life, Jesus did not refuse the honor people wanted to give him. When we speak of humility, we might think of people who are unwilling to receive praise, but Jesus was not. Jesus was not weak and unassuming. Jesus was understanding of who he was and what was appropriate. He submitted his will to the will of the Father, and he lived for him. And in the midst of that, he accepted the honor that people gave him. A few examples are in the the book of Matthew. While in Bethany, a woman came and poured a very expensive perfume on his head. The disciples were upset with the extravagant act of worship, but Jesus was not. Jesus saw it as appropriate. Humility is knowing who we are, and Jesus knew exactly who he was. He didn't tell her to stop because it was appropriate. In the final chapter of Matthew, after the resurrection, the disciples gather, and the scriptures tell us they worshiped him. Jesus accepted that worship because it was completely appropriate. John the Baptist turns away on her. Jesus receives it. And Jesus' interaction with those who would question him, he did not shy away from telling them that he was, in fact, the Messiah. Oh, wait, there's one more thing he didn't do. And it's the reason we celebrate this morning. Jesus did not stay in the grave. We finally get to the reason for the celebration of Easter. Jesus was actually killed on the cross, actually died, physically, totally, completely, however you want to say it. He was laid in a tomb, a borrowed tomb. And when the women came to finish the burial rites on that Sunday morning, they found that Jesus 
was not there. The tomb that once housed his body was empty. His body was gone, and the angels had arrived to interpret for the women what they had seen. This was not a theft. This was a resurrection. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Jesus predicted his own resurrection, but his followers didn't fully comprehend it. They didn't get what he was saying exactly, but they were about to. When we reflect on the resurrection, we find out that it's not just a simple, amazing event from the past, but in fact a life-changing event for all who believe. If we put our trust and our faith in Jesus and his resurrection, we experience the greatest impact on our past, our present, and our future. In terms of our past, the resurrection shows God's stamp of approval on Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, like a pure and spotless lamb, was led to slaughter for us. This means that God accepted the sacrifice. Jesus paid the penalty. And we no longer pay for our own sins. This means we can be fully and completely separated from our past sins. Let that sink in. Fully and completely separated from our past sins. Our debt is completely covered. There can be no greater message to share with the people in our lives. There can be no greater message for us to receive and understand and integrate into our lives. You and I don't have to carry the burden of our past sins. They are gone. In our present life, the resurrection gives us power. Jesus had victory over sin and death. We too can have victory over sin and death in our lives. Paul in Philippians 3 speaks of his desire to know the power of the resurrection in his present life. And God wants us to live with that power each and every day. And in the future, in the maybe not distant future, the resurrection reminds us that he has won. He has, is victorious. The enemy thought he could defeat the Father, and he could not. And the enemy thinks he can defeat the church, and he cannot. Jesus had victory over sin and death, and we will have exactly the same. Death will no longer have the sting that it once had. Death will no longer have the last word, but we will live for eternity, face to face with the Father and the Son, because Jesus actually rose from the dead. He did not stay in the grave. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Through all eternity past, you orchestrated a plan in time to rescue us from our sins, to restore our lives, and to draw us into relationship with you. We celebrate Easter today because of all the things Jesus didn't do, and particularly because he did not stay in the tomb. He rose, and he lives. And because he did, we do and we will also. Amen. If you look to the front of the sanctuary, you will notice that there is a tree that has some crosses on it. I wanted to share with you that in sunrise service, what we invited folks to do was to come forward to put the name of someone that they wanted to share the message of Easter with on one of those crosses and then to hang it on the tree. It's meant to picture the tree that Jesus was hung on hung on with your name on him because he died for you. But then if you notice on the platform here, there is what we attempted to make look like a stone bench. 
On the bench, you'll notice that there are some strips of cloth that have been wrapped around, and it's meant to picture the grave clothes that were in Jesus' tomb, resurrection morning. The reality is, when the disciples, when the women showed up at that tomb, what they saw were those grave clothes still wrapped but without a body inside. When I originally was trying to figure out how to put that together, I had one idea in my mind how I might be able to make the grave clothes look like there had been a body inside of them. It was a terrible idea. I went to somebody who's good with artwork, and, and they had a much better idea of how to make it uh, look right. But that's a mystery. It's a sign of the resurrection. Because how do you get a body out of the clothes that were wrapped around it without getting rid of the shape? You look through the tree to the tomb to see the resurrected Jesus. We invited folks to write the names of people that they wanted to share the message of Easter with. And if I had made enough crosses, I would have put every one of your names on one because I'd love to share the message. But if you have never discovered the risen Lord for yourself, I'll do you one better than to hand you a poem about Easter with some M&Ms attached. That, that was what we invited folks to take to share with their person. I'd love to sit down with a conversation with you and to explain how you can come into a relationship with this Jesus. He is not someone who lived 2,000 years ago. He's not a story in a book. He is the resurrected Lord of the universe who lives inside of me and whose message I would want to share with you. Now what we want to do is we want to give you an opportunity to sing, but if you've never accepted Christ, I would to please talk to me before you leave. I'd love to share Jesus with you. Now, I've told you where Jesus lives. He lives inside of me. Do you think that ought to affect my face? No, I'm really asking you. Do you think it should? <laughs> um, when, Wendy's first husband... Uh, Wendy, Wendy is a very, very witty person, by the way. Very, if you don't know, she's wittier than me. Let's just put it that way. Wendy talks about, in her first marriage, she would crack jokes, and her first husband would respond like this. And she said one time, I don't know why you're not laughing. You know what he said? I'm laughing in here. Some of you sing songs like that. You're, right? We're singing about the resurrection, folks. Please, please, please wrap it in a smile. Because if it doesn't matter today for you, can I assure you the day that you are going to die, you will care. It will make a difference. The day after you die, it will make a difference. Throughout eternity, it will make a difference. So I invite you, with a smile, with a little bit of joy, take your hymn books. Turn with me to number 368. Let's sing He Lives. Let's stand together as we... <laughs>
Lord, thank you that Jesus lives and we can live as well. We can live a real life, a life in submission to you, a life following your law and your commands because that is where true life is found. Help us, Jesus, to follow you and to take the message of salvation to all those who need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.